Hi, welcome everybody. Thank you for today for this um, very important topic. Jewish on campus, what's going on in our schools and what we can do about it. Um, the chat is disabled, but we do have a Q&A and I encourage everybody to ask their questions. We definitely will do our best to answer all of them. We have um, some fabulous experts with us here that will be sharing um, and letting us know, you know, not only what's going on, but solutions and what we can do about it. We wanna thank our sponsors and Jew Hatred, the Law Fair Project, Harut North America, Club Z, Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation, and IPSI, the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. Thank you to our promotional partners, the North Carolina Coalition for Israel, Nabrith International, Zahar Shoar, Yad Yamin, Southern Jewish Life Magazine, and Israel Insight. Um, now, if we could just get the big logo out of the middle, that would be great. And we could start. <laughs> All right, we'll just start. So I am uh, Cheryl Durchinsky, uh, executive director and founder of the Atlanta Israel Coalition. We work with all ages and stages and backgrounds, nonpartisan, non-denominational, and our goal is to end anti-Zionism in our lifetime. We actually truly believe that anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism um, are connected and one and the same. Um, because the moment you say from the river to the sea and uh, suggest that Israel should be wiped out, you're talking about the elimination of the Jewish people, which is highly anti-Semitic. Um, we have with us today, Olga Washington, Carolina Simon and Gerard Fitty. And I would love for everyone to introduce themselves. Olga, can you please share who you're with and a bit about what you do? It's an absolute pleasure to be with everybody here this evening. Thank you so much, Cheryl, as well as the Atlanta Israel Coalition for having me. My name is Olga Washington, as has been introduced, and I am so honored to serve in an incredible Jewish youth teen organization. We are about educating the next generation of Jewish leaders. The organization's name is Club Z, and our audience that we serve are eighth graders all the way through to 12th graders. Why are we so unique? We are unique because we are wanting to inoculate, as our founder, Marsha Mikulova said, inoculate our teens in relation to anti-Semitism before they get onto campus. And the way that we do that is by ensuring that they get specific nuanced education so that they can have the knowledge as to what the conflict is about, their Jewish identity, the right of Jews to their indigenous homeland, and then also equipping them with the skill sets. It's very good to have the knowledge, but if you can't speak, if you can't debate, if you can't critique, if you can't engage, then those efforts are in vain. And so that's what we do. Thank you. Carolina, welcome. There I am. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cheryl and the Atlanta Israel Coalition for having me on tonight. Um, this is a great opportunity. Uh, I am a 20 year Holocaust educator and recently uh, stepped out of the classroom and created Zahor Shoah to expand my reach and help other educators mostly to be able to bring Holocaust education to their classrooms, predominantly eighth grade through high school, um, in, a, in a way that's really geared towards the 21st century student, looking at the um, individuality of the Holocaust victims, as well as how democracy helps prevent uh, uh, genocides in general. So that's me. <laughs> Thank you, Gerard. 
Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with such uh, enlightened and, and uh, perfectly um, dedicated individuals who are fighting the good fight. Thank you, Cheryl, for inviting me and thank you for hosting this tremendous panel. Uh, my name is Gerard Felitti. I'm an attorney and senior counsel at the Lawfare Project, where we fight to uphold the civil rights of the Jewish community against discrimination in all its forms. Unfortunately, we don't get to, uh, to do much when it comes to preparing curriculum or educating our children, but we do get involved when things go wrong. And unfortunately, we've seen in, uh, it, in too many instances in recent times that when you are Jewish and on campus, whether it's in, in middle school or high school or in college, there are a lot of incidents that are going to affect our, our youth. And we are there to try to do what we can to make sure that their rights are uh, protected and that we all have the same educational opportunities uh, to live life and benefit from education without discrimination. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and thank you all in the audience for joining us. So instead of going over the many, many, many incidents that have happened that are anti-Semitic on campus, um, whether it's high school or um, college, you know, that uh, there have been incidences skyrocketing. We get calls all the time and, and you know, we, uh, we take action. Um, let's discuss Holocaust education to start. Carolina, Gerard, I know that that's a, a very um, hot topic right now because we just had legislation passed mandating that it's taught in schools. And yet at the same time, it seems like the Nazi salute and all of this hatred has been skyrocketing. Um, are the schools really teaching this Holocaust education? And the second question I have for you is, um, if they're not, what can we do about that? <laughs> wow, <laughs> big topic. Um, so yeah, you know, they did in, in Congress, they recently passed, I think it was like two years ago, um, the uh, Never Again Education Act. And at, at the surface, it seemed like, wow, all 50 states are now going to jump on board and teach the Holocaust and have a more um, uniform or, you know, agreeable way of certain things have to be covered, certain things will be definitely part of a curriculum uh, sort of thing, and that there will be ample funding for teacher training, et cetera. What I've come to understand is that uh, that's not quite the case. Uh, all the funding goes to the museum in DC, and the museum in DC then has partner museums, et cetera, throughout the country that they then um, increase their uh, Holocaust education programming in that way, uh, which is fantastic on the surface. The problem is, is that the same 20 teachers go to the training in every place that they have them. Um, it is not, when they, when a state says that they have a Holocaust mandate, it is a mandate without any teeth. There's uh, nothing uh, that says it has to be taught in a specific subject or in a specific grade. Uh, or for a specific amount of time. Uh, so most teachers you know, are able to you know, not teach it at all and not technically be in violation of the mandate because they can claim that, well, I thought my neighbor teacher was going to do it. Um, oftentimes it falls back on uh, which textbook has something and therefore the teacher will use whatever the textbook has. So for example, um, the, I think it's the um, Holt textbook or that has the, the eighth grade uh, has um, an excerpt of uh, Anne Frank. And then they also have the L.A.B. Zell Nobel Peace Prize winning speech. Um, and so the eighth grade language arts teacher will address the Holocaust in that way because it's in her textbook. If, if, if they happen to have a textbook that doesn't have it, they just skip it entirely. Um, some high schools with states that have a mandate um, will have a Holocaust history elective and students will then sign up for the class. Um, unfortunately, a lot of counselors 
think that the Holocaust class is a great place for athletes or anyone else who is in need of bumping up their grades to take that class because then it's a it's a movie watching class they think that that you're going to spend the whole time watching things like Schindler's List and how can you possibly fail um, or they think that it's a great place to send students who are in need of um, behavior management so that they can learn why it's bad to be a bully um, so you end up having a, a rather mishmashed group of kids in such a class uh, and it makes it very difficult to have a very high academic standard uh, uh, in, in that kind of an environment. So from a mandate perspective, from a legal perspective, educationally, um, it's not quite what it seems. And so we do need, and when they do teach it, even the teachers who have uh, uh, ample resources and training and what have you, there's a growing push to see the Holocaust as an opportunity to uh, tell the story of human tragedy and social injustice and to make it therefore uh, relevant for all students and not a Jewish story. And so in an effort to make sure that the non-Jewish student in the classroom uh, feels connected to the story, they will make it so that we don't really talk about the Holocaust at all. Uh, we might talk about the Holocaust on day one for, I don't know, five, 10 minutes, and then we move on to genocide in general, and then we move on to social injustice in general. Uh, and so very quickly, uh, what, you know, oftentimes very unintentionally, uh, the Jewish person is completely erased out of the Holocaust class entirely. Um, so that's, that's the reality that we're working with. What we can do is one, uh, you can speak to your uh, uh, Department of Education in whatever state you're in, uh, push for them to have a much more clear uh, mandate in their state so that it's not just you will teach this or you will teach this in X grades, but in what manner, what textbook, what uh, reading list, uh, you know, how are you going to know that that the teachers are actually doing it? Are you going to require some kind of evidence that the schools are in fact engaging in Holocaust education? Um, so that you can do that. You can also um, ask, you know, push for your schools to have Holocaust education programming that in an effort to show uh, uh, diversity and relevance to the, you know, a variety of students, we don't need to erase the Jew from that. Jews come in every color, shape, size, nationality. You know, the Holocaust didn't just take place in Eastern Europe. Uh, it took place in North Africa, it took place in Western Europe, it took place, there, there's so much that includes the story of the Holocaust that goes beyond Auschwitz. Uh, and so we just need to expand our own understanding of what the Holocaust was, who it affected, and how it came to be uh, in order to get that to be a much more comprehensive understanding uh, and I think we would be doing a much better job if we did that. And I think that that would also help reduce anti-Semitism and uh, bring back into the equation the idea that um, you know anti-Semitism and Zionism are key components to a, that comprehensive education as well. Thank you. Gerard, if there is a clear mandate and they're not following it, is there anything that we as parents or interested parties, educators, et cetera, can do legally? Well, the, the, the problem is, and I think a lot of people will be surprised by this, but lawyers will nod their head when knowingly, is the language shall does not mean must. So when you have a law that says that Holocaust education shall be taught, People look at that and say, oh, great, this means it will be taught. That's not actually what it means. It means maybe it'll be taught, maybe it won't. 
so that does require parents to stay very much on top of their school boards to see what's being done to implement Holocaust education, what classes that will be in, what form it will take, and more importantly, what the curriculum is. Um, a lot of times, and, and I have to confess my own disadvantage here, I did not pay attention to Holocaust education when I was going through school. I didn't have to. I had my grandparents. They lived it. I had my neighbors and my friends and my family. They lived it. So I knew more about the Holocaust than they taught in, in schools. Today, it's been reduced to what? Showing Schindler's List. It's still a lesson of Auschwitz and, and, and platitudes of never again. But that doesn't encompass the, the magnitude of the suffering that the Jewish people experienced. And perhaps it's time to revisit what we actually teach about the Holocaust. More than that, it's incumbent on us to reach out to our school boards and say, it's not enough. Teaching about the Holocaust as something that happened at a fixed point in time doesn't address the injustices that resulted from it. We need to provide students with contemporary models of anti-Semitism. We need to show them that what happened in the 1930s and 40s and throughout Jewish history is happening again today. Because you know, when you teach the Holocaust without that context, what happens? You have middle schoolers who greet their Jewish teacher with Hitler salutes. You know, it, it, it's counterintuitive, but if you don't teach more than just the Holocaust, if you, if you don't teach modern anti-Semitism, if you don't teach how anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, you're only creating a bigger problem. And what we can do, unfortunately, there's no remedy in law. We've gotten legislatures to pass laws that, you know, sh we shall teach Holocaust education, but it's up to us as members of the community and as parents to go to the school board meetings and demand that this actually be done. And more than that, to stay on top of them until a proper curriculum is implemented. Thank you. You touched upon Zionism. Olga, Club Z teaches Zionism to students, correct? And, and what the definition is and gives them pride. Um, what are we looking at? Like how, how many students would you say were truly familiar with any of that before Club Z came into um, effect in, in your area? And I mean, you also teach about, you know, the differences between um, what went on in South Africa and the comparison to Israel, the apartheid lie that's always um, told lately. What, what kind of impact does that have on those students if we don't educate and continue doing programming and, um, you know, even not not even just college level everybody's talking about college 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 but you know it starts in high school we need to be able to educate and and give our children the pride to be able to stand up once they go to college and say okay enough this is what's happening how do you install instill that sorry <laughs> not install how do you instill that in these students so you raised several questions and I'm going to do my best to address each one of them. Um, in addressing the first one with regards to how many teens would come to Club Z being Zionist and my experience, I am responsible at the moment for the Charlotte region, is that all of them come. They come because they're proud Zionists, but they come because they want to know how they should stand up for their Zionism and what they should do in difficult circumstances. Our experience, however, outside of Club Z and broadly, and this is part of the problem on college campuses, um, and also then to touch on a little bit on what Gerard said is, they're proud Zionists because that's what they've been told. They have this love for Israel. Jews come from uh, Judea, but they haven't been challenged on that. And so there needs to be context with regards to why are they Zionists? What does Zionists mean? What is the history of Zionism? And what does Zionism mean today? So that when it's a case of, oh, you're a Zionist, but you're a Zionist on land that's been colonized, they're able to effectively respond to that and, and um, give the answers to say, no, Jews are, indigen are in, um, indigenous and you cannot be a uh, colonizer of your own land. Uh, because also remembering that our education and so the responses needs to be relatable, it needs to be relevant and it needs to be able to respond to the attacks, the anti-Semitism of today. One of the attacks that you allude to is this, Israel is an apartheid lie. Right. It's actually, in my opinion, one of the growing forms of anti-Semitism, because what the narrative seeks to do is it seeks to take away the Jews identity with regards to being from the land, because they are then racist and then they're then colonizers. So part of what Club Z does, we do it in different ways using different te techniques, but I'll highlight, I think, for now, just two of them is when these accusations come, 
is to not just give them talking points to say, well, Israel is not an apartheid state because it's got X number of Arabs as part of the Knesset. Uh, okay, they're part of the Knesset, but they are still part of the Knesset on land that has been colonized, is to give the tools to be able to ask critical questions, first of all, as they engage with the information so that they themselves can be knowledgeable. Um, zooming in and zooming out. What do people mean when they say apartheid? What is apartheid? Where does, that come, where does that term come from? Is it a term that has specific meaning to a specific land? And if it does, where is that land? Who are the people that were involved? Um, let's zoom out a little bit. In what context do we hear this lie being told? What is the narrative? What is the intention between behind this um, lie that's been told? Oftentimes when people say that Israel is an apartheid state, they look to international law, quote unquote, and use that as their um, tool to further the point that it is a justified label against Israel. We teach our teens, just because somebody says that this is a source doesn't mean that it's from there. Go and research more. What does international law mean? How does international law have application? Um, and so by challenging them to think critically and also by giving them advocacy advocacy skills excuse me almost said advocacy schools advocacy skills with regards to being able to engage with people not just on social media even though at the moment that's a hot place to be we have found that not only are they able to say you know what not only am I a Zionist and a proud Zionist because I understand my heritage from way back in the day, three, over 3,000 years ago, but I also understand how that heritage has applicability to me here as a teen living in the United States. And then within that context, having an understanding of the apartheid line, the narrative, um, then being able to effectively respond to that um, and then in the process, not only be proud for themselves, but then also sway their detractors. Thank you. So do you do you feel like, um, you know, the the recent um, amnesty and the UN and you know, like, do they have, are they hearing about that? Is that something that in a high school is touching these students where they're believing it and hearing it? Or do you, you feel like um, you're not seeing that at all? We are seeing it. And it's primarily because of the influence of social media. So Right now we have social justice warriors who are experts at being keyboard warriors. And so our teens are exposed to these various accusations that they see, whether it's on Instagram or on TikTok or on Snapchat. Um, and in some instances in the schools, more so in the schools I've seen where a teacher either deliberately or even some instances inno innocently will refer to the amnesty report because amnesty is supposed to be this internationally highly regarded impartial organization that is a good authority. And so then when they hear this, because they've been taught to interrogate the sources, because they've been taught to zoom in and zoom out, just two of the examples that I've used, um, they're able to one, either identify that no, this is a lie and it's a lie that is speaking to um, anti-Zionism, which then in its turn is speaking to anti-Semitism and then effectively respond to it because they've got the education. Um, if I could maybe say one thing in relation to that, there are so many incredible Jewish organizations doing great work and educating on great things. But if we aren't educating on issues and topics that are relevant, you know, I, I laugh, I, I'm, I almost joke about this whole colonizer thing, but it's true. So if somebody's going to say to you, all right, but you're a colonizer state, and you're like, but Jews have got, um, they grow tomatoes. We are a light to the nation. Okay, but how does that help you? If you see an infomercial or an infograph on Instagram because a social media influencer says that to you, how do you respond in relation to the apartheid narrative? So teaching them, again, how to research, who are these bodies? Yes, who is the United Nations? What has the United Nations done in relation? to Israel. Again, zooming out, we're finding that the teens are able to respond to those accusations effectively. Do you have any information that you share with these students? Like, or are you letting them do the research and then they come back to you? So no, ma'am, we have a curriculum. We have a curriculum that is specific. We have a curriculum that is nuanced. We have a curriculum that actually is quite in-depth. Our program is a program that extends over two years and sometimes even over three years. 
where we touch on various topics. Uh, topics that we look at will include indigeneity. Topics that, will, that we look at will include language. Um, why do we say Arab-Israeli war, or should we be saying Palestinian-Israeli war, or vice versa? Um, we also touch on topics like apartheid. What is apartheid? And we spend an hour to two hours bringing in experts who will look at that. We will look at what is Zionism? What are the different forms of Zionism? We'll look at, for example, refugees. Who are refugees? How were the refugees created in 1947, 1948? And were there only Palestinian refugees that were created at that time, or other Arabs created at that time? Um, and then also looking at the the Palestinian um, term itself, we, we educate our teens as to where does that term come from? Why were they Arabs in 1948, but then later on they became the Pal Palestinians? How does that work? So these are some of the topics that we look at um, and we look at the nuance behind it. Again, we look at narrative, we look at agenda, we look at the, the usage of different words over time. So those are some of the topics that we teach. Um, in our teaching, we also ensure that we bring about advocacy because that is something that is important. The teens need to be able to respond. How do you know what a rebuttal is? How do you know, um, how can you identify um, an agenda when somebody's trying to debate you and somebody's trying to talk to you? How do you write? How do you write an op-ed? How do you respond to um, a teacher in an email? What is an effective way of engaging with yourself? And so there's both the curriculum that's then presented to them, but then also the actual hard as well as soft skills that are taught. Thank you. Somebody's asking if you could explain, uh, what, sorry. They wanna know how many high school chapters Club Z has and where do they meet? They wanna know if it's hard to recruit students to join? Sadly, it is not hard to recruit students. And I say sadly because of the growing anti-Semitism that's happening across the world and parents as well as teens are finding themselves ill-equipped to be able to respond to that. Um, but happily it's growing because we aren't just about being able to respond to anti-Semitism. We are being about raising Jewish teens who are proud of their heritage and who are proud of who they are and who have an understanding of their history and also who also have an understanding as to um, how they can be leaders within the United States leaders across the diaspora and also leaders in their communities which would comprise not only Jewish people but non-Jewish allies as well. At the moment we have chapters in the Bay Area which is our headquarters. We also have a chapter in Los Angeles. In New York we've got three chapters in Westchester, in Manhattan as well as in Brooklyn and then we also have a chapter here in Charlotte. The way that we establish ourselves is where a community raises its hand and say we need you, we are willing to work together because we rely very much on the families. We also rely on the community. We are a community-based organization, even though our focus is on teens, excuse me, is on teens, not teams. Our focus is on teens. That's where we are. So we are looking to grow. Um, anybody who is interested is more than welcome to look us up, www.clubz.org. Uh, it is my firm belief. Many people don't know that I'm not Jewish. I'm also not American as you may have picked up from my accent. I've had the opportunity of um, being a part of various organizations, speaking at very, on various platforms across the United States. And Club Z is very unique in its work. And I would encourage any person who has any relationship with an eighth grader all the way through to the 12th grader to be a part of Club Z. Thank you. Um, we have some questions. And I think this one, um, Maybe uh, Gerard, you can answer. Um, the first one involves uh, a friend's daughter who's 13, eighth grade, her classmates tell her that Israel murders Palestinian children and sells their organs. What suggestions do you have in terms of how she could respond to this blood libel, which goes unchecked in her public school? And is there anything we can do, again, in the public schools um, to make sure that these things are addressed. Well, my, my, my first suggestion is that this, th this is something that needs to be addressed by the parents to the schools. Th the most important thing to start anything going is to make sure that the school is aware of, of what's happening. Now, this, this is something that is easily seen as harassment. Uh, this type of harassment is either barred by the school's codes, the school's district's codes, by the school's 
principles if it's a private school, but also it falls under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act uh, for any schools that receive public funding. And there are plenty of schools, if you look at schools that get lunch money, for example, from the federal government, they receive federal funds, Title VI applies. But the, the, the first thing that needs to be done is to create a record. You need to talk to the school because nothing can happen if the school deals with it. So if you don't raise this complaint to the administration, to the teachers and the administration of the school, then the school doesn't know that it's a problem. It doesn't know that it has to act and it's required by law to act. So that's the first step is making sure that there is a complaint, that it's in writing, that the school acknowledges that it received it. And then it's a matter of the school taking action. Uh, schools have guidelines that they have to follow. There are rules, there are laws that have to be followed. And as I said, it's anti-discrimination laws apply as well for, for a lot of public schools. So the question becomes what the school does about it. And, and this is where, quite frankly, we, we see a lot of problems because I think most of us will agree, all of us will agree that schools are not doing enough, that they're letting a lot of behaviors slide by, or they have a general statement saying that anti-Semitism and all forms of bigotry are not acceptable. And then they start listing every minority group that's ever been offended by someone and say, this is unacceptable. But they shy away from just saying, this is anti-Semitism, this is discrimination, this is unacceptable. So that's the thing to push for, is to demand that your school take responsibility and actually recognize that this is anti-Semitism, that this is Jew hatred, and that it has to be remedied. Now, in, in point of fact, there is no one thing that the law requires to be done. There's a lot of discussion. You know, A school can implement an education program that talks about the Holocaust. Again, we, we may not see that as being enough, but for purposes of the law, it unfortunately usually is but the school has to do something. It can't just ignore problems because when they ignore problems, that's where lawyers like me come in. And believe me, that's not fun for anyone when lawyers get involved in these situations, but we're always happy to, to listen and to see if there's anything that we can do. Um, but that's the, the point is you, you have to start by making a complaint. The school has to be aware that this is a serious issue. And we've seen this, you know, we've seen this in, in Georgia and in Cobb, in, in, you know, in Cobb schools as well. Uh, you know, you need to get publicity on this issue. You need for the school board to feel pressure to take action when you see that they're dragging their feet. Because until the community gets involved as well, then the, the, the board feels that this is just something that can be swept under the rug. That, oh, it's, it's kids being kids. But that's the problem because we, we would not tolerate as a society any other minority group being treated this way. Now, what, what, what we've seen during this pandemic is we've seen increasing sensitivity to Asian Americans, which, which is terrific. But you can't just say, well, Jews, you know, we're, we're not going to apply the same standards. We're just going to let them deal with it because, you know, they're, they're white appearing or they have privilege or it doesn't affect them as badly. We have to assert our rights as minorities and we have to assert our civil rights and to demand the same treatment that everyone else gets, the same protection that everyone gets. So you start by letting the school know that it's a problem and then demanding accountability. And if that accountability doesn't happen, you, you reach out to us and we, we see what we can do about it. Thank you. Um, that leads into the next question. Um, we as Jews speak out about racism and every other ism every day. What can we do to get um, people to speak out against anti-Semitism? And honestly, I, I know Atlanta Israel Coalition is a partner of the End Jew Hatred Movement. And um, I think, you know, as parents, get involved, get involved in these organizations, whether it's Atlanta Israel Coalition that works closely with End Jew Hatred, um, you know, whether it's talking to someone like Carolina about, you know, getting some more Holocaust education in your schools, um, you know, Olga suggested, um, Club Z, there's so many different resources here but we need you to participate. Uh, the more participation we have, the better off we all are and the better off our children are. So um, I will get to the next question. <laughs> we have quite a bit and um, we only have uh, another half an hour left. So I, uh, I appreciate everybody um, being here and being patient. So um, the, there's a question asking if there's ev any evidence Holocaust education prevents anti-Semitism. Carolina, I'm 
I'm sure you have that answer, don't you? Um, while I personally don't have empirical data uh, to show that, uh, I do know uh, from personal experience that when Holocaust education is taken on from a comprehensive uh, uh, approach, that it's not just about 1933 to 1945, it's about the 2000 years that led to 1933, and it's about the 80 years since 1945, uh, then yeah, it does create a much more unified community sense at a school. Students then understand each other on a different level. They feel much more compelled to live up to the ideals of being each other's ally. They understand why being disrespectful of differences is a problem. Uh, when we look at Holocaust education the way it's been done for the last 25 years, uh, for the most part, where it is very, um, like, almost like a bubble, right? So, so that it's just the 1933 to 1945 uh, experience, uh, and we focus almost entirely on Berlin and Poland, then no, students end up with uh, not really having a big benefit from it, and it doesn't really help end anti-Semitism. Um, the Claims Conference in 2018 uh, did a survey and found that, uh, you know, almost half of American millennials and Generation Z students didn't know what Auschwitz was, didn't know who Hitler was, didn't know that six million Jews had been murdered. Um, so you know, you have Holocaust education out there for 25 years, but it's not really getting the job done, which is why I promote the idea of a more comprehensive, interactive, interdisciplinary approach to the subject, um, because I, I personally have seen how that then brings students together uh, of all uh, religions and cultures, and they can see each other uh, in a much different light. And then yes, we do have hope at the end of that road as a result of that. Thank you. Um, Gerard, I think you can help me with the answer to the next one. How do we go about getting these anti-Semitic speakers that want to speak publicly at a school um, to stop? And I know that it wasn't that long ago, a certain Zoom um, was canceled for a, a, a terrorist that was going to speak, correct? I believe we were all uh, working together to make that happen. I know that's um, maybe an exception, not the rules. So can you share a bit more about legally if there's anything that could be done? Well, let me let me tell you about the Zoom. As, as you've alluded to, uh, this involved Leila Khaled, a known uh, leading figure in the PFLP, which is a designated foreign terrorist organization. She has been invited many times to speak on college campuses via Zoom uh, during the pandemic, which, which is funny in a way because for all the problems we've had in the pandemic, it seems the terrorist organizations have found a great way to spread their propaganda and their hate. Now, before the pandemic, you wouldn't imagine someone like this coming to campus because they couldn't. They wouldn't be allowed entering into the United States unless it was in handcuffs. But on Zoom, it seemed that anything went until we all pointed out to Zoom that there were federal laws prohibiting providing material support to terrorism, and that's what this was. So that's the good news, is that sometimes there is something that can be done. The bad news is, unfortunately, we live in a country that places a premium on freedom of speech, which means that unless you're dealing with a terrorist organization or someone who is saying things so beyond the pale, literally inciting violence, meaning that there is an imminent threat based on that speech that some violent act will happen, you can't really cancel someone. The flip side to that is while you can't do it legally because they have you know, First Amendment rights and these apply even to state to, to private institutions, excuse me, in states like California, we, we saw at USC, you know, we, we had a, uh, a student who wanted to, who basically said that she wanted to kill Zionists. 
and nothing happened to her by the school's policy because this is protected by the First Amendment and California state law applies the First Amendment to private schools as well. But what I'm getting at is that this, this is, if you will, a failure in, in the ability of the legal system to protect all of us to the extent that we want. But this is why we need activism. This is why, you know, when I'm not practicing law, I'm an activist with the NGO hatred movement because we need social pressure. We need to send a message that this speech is unacceptable and it won't be tolerated. Can you imagine having any other minority group targeted by a, a speaker in a school? No, because it's not going to happen. You know, it, it, it's just simply unacceptable in this world of, of placing values on social justice that any minority is targeted. But yet somehow we don't seem to act out, we don't seem to protest, we don't make our positions clear when it happens to the Jewish community. So that's what we need, we need this fundamental shift, we need to get together and to push the idea that, that you know, Jews are indigenous to Israel, that Jews have uh, the same rights as other minorities in the United States and we can't simply be ignored or oppressed. It, it takes that social activism to get this done because legally, for the most part, unfortunately, we can't cancel speakers we don't like. The flip side to this is also get speakers that you want. Get your, you know, get invitations to people, to any of the people on this panel to come and speak to your school. And if the school doesn't allow that, but they allow, you know, anti-Israel speakers or anti-Semitic speakers to come, then call us because that's a legal issue. When you're allowing one speech but blocking another, then you can take action. So you know, get out there and, 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 and tell your school district, tell your school board that this is unacceptable and this type of speech is harmful. But also get together and invite speakers, put out the message that you want to put out. That's equally important and something everyone can do. Thank you. And if anyone in the audience has any questions about the Andrew Hatred Movement or speakers, et cetera, please feel free to contact me. You know, we are here to help. Um, Olga, this is a question for you directly. There, uh, this individual wants to know if you're going to expand Club Z um, to non-Jewish students too. Can they participate? It's a question that Club Z has considered several times. Um, our first and our primary focus are Jewish students. There is a need uh, for our education to Jewish students, ensuring that they are proud, that they are articulate, that they have an understanding of what the issues are and how they can effectively, effectively address them. Um, at the same time, however, part of our work is outreach, uh, part of the activism that we do, reaching out to the non-Jewish allies. Our non-Jewish allies have over history, have proven to be very, very um, helpful in the cause to fight anti-Semitism, and frankly, we need them today. The other side, the uh, Israel hater side, has done a great job with regards to intersectionality and bringing other people's issues together. Not that I'm advocating for intersectionality, I've got my own thoughts around that. That being said, if we are to expand our program to reach non-Jews as well, even though they are invited, for example, to our national conference, which is an incredible, incredible weekend where youngsters, doesn't matter if you're Jewish or non-Jewish, part of Club Z or not part of Club Z, come together for a weekend of learning. If we're going to expand the core work that we do to non-Jews, it's going to require us to think very carefully as to how we do it. As you can appreciate it, there are nuances, there are things that are specific to Jewish people, whether it's culturally, whether it is um, from a religious perspective that are frankly, very strange to people that are non-Jews. Uh, just like I myself, if I were to introduce my Tswana culture, which is a tribe that I come from, to somebody who's not from the Tswana culture, people look at me and be like, oh, that's a bit weird, because there's no understanding with regards to the in-workings. And so we want to ensure, because we're about the long-term, because we're about ensuring that it's not just a quick fix, that if we are going to do that, that it makes sense. That's my long answer to say, maybe in time, but at the moment we are about making sure that our Jewish teens are proud and are able to stand. Thank you. Carolina, I believe this is for you. Um, as Holocaust survivors um, are um, unfortunately passing, what can um, second and third generations do to help um, spread their families' messages to students? and can they participate in what you're doing? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so there is an organization called 3G, 
for third generation survivors. Uh, they have chapters around the country and they are growing. Um, in Atlanta, we don't have a chapter yet. Uh, but I know that there's like 3G New York, 3G New Jersey, 3G Arizona, 3G Miami, for example. Um, they're the, they all individually have their own Instagram pages and what have you, and they um, get together and share uh, and their stories at schools. So they partner with organizations like mine, um, but they also work independently uh, to get their grandparents' stories out there. Um, the same is true of second generation, although I don't know of a 2G uh, per se organization, but I do know that set the children of survivors um, do speak on their parents' behalf uh, at schools. Um, the symposium, I have a symposium that I'm putting together and I have a lot of my speakers who will be coming are second and third generation survivors. Uh, there's a great need for them to take the torch and and keep that uh, you know moving forward um, without the personal human connection to the stories of the holocaust the holocaust becomes just another historical statistic and we cannot emotionally connect to numbers six million is a very large number. It makes it impossible to make any kind of personal connection to that. And when you have no personal connection to a tragedy, you have zero reason to care about it and to try and figure out how to prevent that from happening to anyone else ever again. So the, the work of the second and third generations and fourth generations, there's some people who uh, are lucky enough to meet their great grandparents and to have relationships with their great grandparents and be able to then um, carry on that uh, for them is extremely important uh, to, to Holocaust education and to the Jewish community in general. So you have somebody who um, has posted a few times um, asking about why Jews, why students aren't taught that Jews are from Judea and why they're not taught that um, they're native to Israel. And um, that when you have speakers that are pro-Israel, anti-Zionist, and I'm assuming it's on college campuses that this person's referring to, because unfortunately college campuses, some of them have gotten very much out of control. And um, that was, one of the many reasons we started Atlanta Israel Coalition. Um, they wanna know what could be done when they have speakers in and um, the anti-Zionist protests so loudly it shuts down speakers. Um, has anyone dealt with this firsthand? Does anyone wanna comment? If not, I will. Well, my comment is they need to join Club Z because we teach that. <laughs> I was going to say, my, the way I teach the Holocaust, I look at the entire history of Jews. And so I do look at where did anti-Semitism kind of start? How did we even get to it, you know, Europe to begin with, to be able to end up in gas chambers in Poland? Uh, and it was, you know, we were in Israel first and when we were made into a diaspora. So, you know, it, it, uh, this is, you know, comprehensive education does help alleviate that. Right. And I think it all goes back to, um, you know, putting pressure on the schools and as parents educating our children and getting them more involved because unfortunately, you know, we do have teachers that may even mean well, but they're teaching curriculums that really are biased and, and not accurate. Um, Gerard, did you unmute because you wanted to add something? Oh, I, I was I was only going to add, we, we have seen this, unfortunately, and the this is something that we can deal with better than other circumstances from a legal perspective, in that if, you know, you are being uh, harassed on campus, you're not being allowed to have your speakers come without having this kind of uh, reception that we've all seen, uh, you know, cursing Jews, death to Israel, uh, from the river to the sea, the, the, the sort of behavior that's been so horrific. 
if the college isn't doing anything about it, that's actionable. And that's something that we have had some success in the past, for example, at San Francisco State University, obtaining a settlement where the school does do something uh, to ensure that Jews can have their voices heard uh, if they've not been very uh, active in allowing that to happen. So again, I mean, I think it always starts with, you know, as, as Carolina and Olga uh, keep saying, it, it's about education. It's about having that proud identity and being able to, to defend yourself and assert yourself, uh, you know, and, and and as, as Cheryl says, it's about contacting, reaching out to the school, demanding uh, a change. Uh, but this is something that is also on the uh, on, on the part of the spectrum that is legally actionable. Uh, so if this is something that's going on, absolutely, it's, you know, let, let's talk because this is unacceptable. Thank you. Um, I couldn't agree with you more about it being incredibly unacceptable. And unfortunately, um, we've seen it too many times. So uh, again, I will stress, if students, parents, anybody want to reach out, I'm available. I know the other speakers have expressed that they are. Um, you know, we're here to help. That was um, basically uh, what I was going to share before I ask, because we're running out of time. The very, very much uh, one of the last questions, because we've got it so many times, Everybody wants to know how you got involved, Olga. Involved with Club Z or involved in, in the advocacy? In space? Involved in advocacy and Club Z. Well, maybe let me answer the latter part. So I got involved in Club Z because I have the utmost respect for Marsha. We live, um, and just again, she's the founder and executive director. We live in a world where moral clarity is in shortage. We're standing up for truth with uh, where being unafraid to speak up uh, with not necessarily going with the crowd is cool to do. And, and she's somebody that provides that leadership. So to be in an organization where that is lived day in and day out has been a blessing. But specifically with regards to the Israel space, there are in a nutshell three reasons why I do what I do. Maybe three and a half, the half being I love young people. And I've always, once I discovered I had a big mouth, uh, wanted to use that mouth to be able to inspire and instill courage and hope. And um, the first reason is because of my faith. I'm a Christian and I am grateful for the Jewish people. I'm grateful for the fact that without Judaism, there wouldn't be Christianity. So I'm very cognizant of the fact that we talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're not ours, right? Uh, we talk about King David and, and we, we look at Torah and the Old Testament. I mean, that belongs to the Jewish people. And so we wouldn't exist without them. That's the first reason. The second reason, um, and maybe in, in relation to the first reason, the values of truth and justice. If I'm going to say that I'm a Christian that loves the truth and I've got to speak the truth when I see lies being told, I've got to stand up for a people who are being hated just because of who they are, which then goes into my second reason. And that is as a South African. As a South African, I'm cognizant and very aware of our history, of the fact that we suffered during apartheid, that Black people were impacted, my parents, myself, my, our ancestors. And so how dare another people take our history, our narrative, and manipulate it and misappropriate it in order to instill hate against another people. We've got a responsibility, a moral obligation to be like, no, that's not what apartheid is. And that's not what's happening there in Israel. Um, so jealously guarding our history. Then the third reason is because I'm a very proud African. As a proud African, I look at my continent and see not what many people see, uh, which is accurate to the eye, but is not her fullest potential. What is accurate to the eye is poverty, is strife, is corruption. Um, but what is the truth about Africa is her potential in relation to her people, her resources, so she is rich in minerals and all various uh, wonderful things, but we have a problem. And in overcoming our various problems, we need a friend. As I study history, I know of a friend, and this friend was a nation that was born in 1948, who even though she was very young, during the 1950s and 1960s, when these African countries were coming out of colonization, Israel was on our soil. After the United States of America, Israel had the most number of embassies, helping us to build our roads, create our infrastructures, teaching us things in relation to technology, agriculture, medicine. And so if in the 1950s and 1960s, Israel was our friend and was able to help us, 
why can't she help us now? She can help us now. She wants to help us now. But people that don't want to see Africa rise to her fullest potential don't want African nations to have a relationship with Israel. And so as somebody who wants to see her continent reach her fullest potential, it is important and incumbent on us to know the truth, first of all, as Africans, that we should not shun Africa. We should not BDS Africa, but extend a, um, a hand of friendship to her. And then also to the Jewish teens of Africa is then ready to say, hey, yes, let's work together. We've got to have teens who are going to be leaders to say, yes, we're proud to be Jewish. We're proud of the state of Israel and so let's do this together and so those are the three main pillars that inform why I do what I do. That's very inspirational and you definitely shared quite a bit that I think um, educated some of our audience here said things that I didn't even know about so thank you. <laughs> yes ma'am. Um, we're going to unfortunately have to wrap up. I I'd like to ask each of the um, speakers, if there's anything you'd like to leave the audience with, any words about, you know, what's going on in the schools or how they can help or what you're doing. Uh, Olga, since you're right here and you're unmuted, <laughs> do you want to continue? <laughs> If I may, with most humble of respect, uh, put a challenge out, and that is a challenge primarily to parents, that's a challenge to community leaders, and that is it can't be a luxury to have education in relation to who the Jewish people are, education in terms of who the state of Israel is, irrespective of her flaws. You don't have to like the policies. You don't have to like who's prime minister from one season to another. But having an appreciation of the connection that Jews have, irrespective of where they live in the diaspora, having an understanding of who you are as a Jew, as, as Jewish people, having a broad context with regards to Jewish history from the Holocaust to the journey of Abraham, um, to, to the land of Judea, I mean, all of these aspects, the most humble of respects, the challenges, it cannot be a luxury. It has to be as much as people are looking to fight for their own causes and make sure that everybody knows who they are and what their cause is, the Jewish people have got to stand up and be like, now's our time and we're demanding equal opportunities as well as making sure that our voice is equally heard. Thank you. I couldn't agree with you more. Carolina. Yeah, so I would say a final thought on Holocaust education is we've said a lot tonight about what's going on in schools and what we can as parents and community members do uh, to you know, elevate Holocaust education in schools, but it doesn't have to just be in schools. Uh, you can and should um, reach out to the areas of your community where you are more comfortable, most connected, whether that's your synagogue, your temple, your mosque, your church, your community center, uh, the Boys and Girls Club, you know, um, speakers like me, you know, I say, I always say, I have program, we'll travel. Um, I, <laughs> there are no boundaries to where Holocaust education, especially a comprehensive program, can go. Uh, there's there might be some age limits. It really shouldn't be for anyone, you know, under seventh or eighth grade, but you can certainly have a very wide scope of who and how uh, this is uh, addressed. Um, it, you don't have to just relegate it to the traditional classroom. So uh, I would say, you know, um, be involved uh, and widen widen the web of where it can go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Gerard. Well, first, thank you, Cheryl, for putting together this terrific program. And thank you, everyone, for the amazing content. I think everyone is leaving tonight knowing a lot more and being more confident in, in what needs to be done. And from my perspective, it comes down to two things. One, be proud. If you're, if you're Jewish, be proud of your identity, assert your identity, don't run away from it, don't hide it. If you support the Jewish community, stand there with the Jewish community and be proud for what we are achieving. Be proud in, in, in Jewish identity and in our ability to express it. And the second one is be active, be involved, get involved with, you know, you don't have to, although it would be great to have you uh, show up at an end Jew hatred rally, or, you know, it, although it would be great to have you participating in, in actions, be involved in your community, know what's being taught in your kid's school, ask for copies of the curriculum, show up to board meetings, 
run for the school board. That's that's a novel one. You have a voice, use it. Now, too many of us sit back and groan about what's going on in our schools, in our in our in our community, and we feel like we don't have anything we can do about it. We need to know what's going on because you know what? Sometimes there's a legal remedy. Sometimes it's about education. Sometimes it's about advocacy. But it's always about knowing what's going on and being involved. So hound your school district. Ask for what they're doing to teach the Holocaust. Ask what their policies are about anti-Semitism and bigotry. Ask to know how you can be involved to provide information to the school. What speakers you can help bring in to teach about anti-Semitism and Jew hatred. Be involved. That's the most important thing you can ever do to your, for your kids. And that's the most important thing you can do now. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. And thank you to all our viewers. And again, um, if you want to be involved here in uh, Georgia or Southeast uh, in and Jew hatred, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Atlanta Israel Coalition is a partner. And I think, that, again, the more we do together, the more we speak out, the better off we all are. Um, so again, thank you to our incredible speakers for being here. And thanks again to our sponsors, our promotional partner. I wanna mention for those of you who are here, we're going to be um, doing a live Israel tour. It's coming soon, more information, November, November 6th through the 15th. Um, and uh, we'd love if you have any questions for you to just reach out. Um, we're partnering with B'nai B'rith on Enlighten America, which is a wonderful um, contest for students. So if you go to enlightenamerica.weebly.com to learn how to enter uh, and get more information there, that would be fantastic. Um, to learn more about us or to uh, donate, because we do all this programming for free. We'd appreciate any support you could provide. Um, there are several ways that you can, you know, follow our Facebook page. If you had questions today that we weren't able to answer, by all means, you know, contact me. I, I apologize. We had um, 38 questions and only a certain amount of time. So thank you again to our wonderful speakers, Carolina, Gerard, Olga, I can't express my gratitude enough and um, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening.